channel up, right? He's not ready for the election. How's Richard doing? Is he already for the fishing trip? <laughs> <laughs> I bet he is. He might be going down there. Are ready to go? Okay. I'm going to call the meeting this order of the Assembly Public Safety Committee. Uh, it is February 1st. Wow. At 11 a.m. Uh, let's start with calling the roll, please. Mr. Constant. Mr. Cross. Here. Thank you. Ms. Dern. Here. Ms. LaFrance. Mr. Presverdia. Here. Mr. Peterson. Present. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Mr. Rivera. Present. Mr. Salt. Here. Mr. Sweet. Here. Mr. Voland. Happy to be here. Ms. Zalatel. Thank you. Uh, I believe Ms. Zal Zalatel is here. She's just stepped out for a moment. Okay, well, um, if we could just have uh, Chief Curl, if you want to bring you and whomever you brought with you up, I think there's plenty of room today for, for, for folks to be up here. I think it's going to be all about APD today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just a reminder to members on the phone, if you um, if you want to get in the queue, you can send me a text. Um, and I will make sure that you're uh, put into the queue. And Chief, do you have do you have slides actually to, you're going to bring up as well? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, all right. I hand it over to you and you, you can begin. Thanks. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I want to everyone to introduce themselves. Craig, if you could start me talking to the mic, introduce yourself, tell you what your job is here at, e at EPD. Uh, yeah, just tap it and it'll turn. Oh, there we go. All right. Technology. Uh, Lieutenant Evans, uh, Dacia Patrol, Anchorage Police Department. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Soto at uh, APD and commander for the Intel unit, the CAP uh, team, and the CIT uh, team as well. Brian Warburg, uh, Anchorage Police Department. Uh, I'm the supervisor for the Crime Analysis and Criminal Intelligence Unit. Sean Case, Deputy Chief. Thanks everyone for being here. And just a reminder that um, uh, I've just learned that when people are speaking on the phone, we got to make sure to turn all the mics off just so it allows them to speak. And it interferes with it. Chief. All right. Uh, we're going to start off with our year end stats. So you guys have an idea of uh, what 2022 looked like. Uh, here's our homicide uh, stats for last year. We had a significant bump from 2020 and 2021, but we're still below what we normally average. Uh, this is just post COVID. Uh, obviously people are out and about a lot more and we expected to see a, a jump in some crime. And unfortunately homicide was one of the crimes that went up, but it's still uh, 20, 2019, we had 35. We averaged between 28 and 
35 a year. So we're right around where our average was for the previous before 2019. Any questions on the homicide one? Next slide. Yeah, Chief, oh. just, um, I, and I think we'll probably get to this. Um, yeah, I, I think what maybe worked for me is we'll, we'll go through these and then we can talk about your, your, your understanding as to, as to why and the, and the relationship to, 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 to your department. So I think we can just go through them and then we'll, and then we'll probably do, do questions unless there's questions specifically about each, each slide. Thanks. Okay, here's our property crimes. Uh, I've got to get my slides in order. As you can see, uh, trending down or just about the same. Uh, we, we've continued to trend down for several years. I had a slight uptick in stolen vehicles. I think a lot of uh, that had to do with uh, TikTok and Instagram, where we saw a increase in Kias bring, being stolen across the country and probably the world. It was uh, you could get in there easily and steal Kias uh, or Hyundai's. Well, it was Hyundai's. It was Hyundai. Oh, both of them. There were vehicles made in uh, Korea. Uh, so there was TikTok challenges. We saw we saw an increase in that here in Anchorage as well. We actually took a proactive step and uh, made several arrests on it. So that's the uh, the vandalism one. I'm not really sure why we had an increase in that. Just uh, Again, coming out of COVID, more people on the street, uh, more opportunity for people to interact with each other. Uh, next slide. Chief, actually, if I can interrupt you, just, um, and I know it says it on here, but just can you clarify for us the, the difference between the information uh, in terms of what are, what are calls, what are reports versus what are, what are you know, actual verified crimes? There, 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 there's a difference here between the first one and the second one. Is that correct? The first one is not calls. The first one is actually um, homicides, right? Yeah, I have my expert, Brian, go ahead. And then the, the next one is calls. So it's not necessarily these are calls for crimes or are these verified crimes is what I'm, I'm trying to make, make sure we understand. Absolutely. The homicide data is counts homicide victims. So these are verified homicides. The next two slides, this one and the one for violent crimes, uh, that involves calls for service. This is times we're called for the public. So these numbers will not reflect, like, say, uniform crime reporting stats because that's reportable offenses. These are reflective of the times that the public has called to us for service. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. And here's our finally our violent crime stats for uh, 2022. Uh, so a slight increase in uh, assaults. Uh, Luckily, uh, sexual assaults went down from the previous year, and uh, the robberies were slightly up. Uh, you can see we're still trending. You can see where our average is for the, the past four years. It, it's pretty steady. Uh, slight uptick, uh, like I said, in the assaults and the robberies because there's just more people in Anchorage and more people on the streets as uh, COVID comes out. And that's the... Uh, the calls, the uh, crime stats for last year. Do I have any questions about the crime stats? I don't see anybody right now. I have a couple and I'll keep my eyes open for other members. So you, I, I really do want to dig just a little bit into your understanding of the why. You, you, you mentioned the, oh, am I looking at my phone? Oh, look at that. I've got texts. <laughs> I guess I'm the one that said text me, right? Okay, well, I'll hold my, my, my question. Um, uh, I have Ms. Clinton Davidson is is here, but I don't see other text. But Mr. Rivera, you want to be Ms. Stern? Go ahead. Uh, thank you for being here. And I'm, I'm just looking at these uh, statistics related to robberies. I had a call from a constituent last week who was very concerned about shoplifting. I don't know if you could tell me in, in this uh, how much of that might be related to shoplifting in particular, but he said there's quite a problem. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you've heard that as well. Well, shoplifting is different from robbery. You can't have a shoplift that turns into a robbery if somebody uses force to make their their getaway from the store. Uh, shoplifting is a, a problem. Um, we actually, we do undercover operations uh, the year, several times a year that we work with the uh, local businesses and we 
actually do stings where we go in there and uh, just go in there, try to catch as many shoplifters, teach the loss prevention people what to look for, uh, give them guidance on what they should do to try to prevent shoplifting in their stores. And we, we uh, are always open to helping stores. And uh, a lot of times it's actions that, that we recommend that actually reduce the shoplifting. If they, if anyone wants help with shoplifting, they can contact us. Our cap team will go out there and actually do an, an evaluation of their store. Uh, it is a problem. And uh, to go back to uh, your question, Cameron, why we think this is happening. I, this is just a guess and I don't want to throw legal under the bus or the district attorney's office on the bus, but 2020, 2021, the legal system is backlogged tremendously. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, they are forced or they, they are forced to dismiss a lot of cases. If you arrest one of these people and they get let go, the word spreads that, hey, I can commit a crime. I'm not going to go to jail. And I think that the slight uptick here, until we can get take care of the backlog in our legal system where offenders know that there is a price to pay when you commit crimes, I, I think we're, we're going to see a slight uptick as well this year. But I think once the legal system gets back on track and there are consequences for criminals who commit crimes, I think we'll see a steady decline after that. And we do, uh, we try to be proactive in, in anticipating crime. We'll get that. We'll get to that in our crime analysis section here shortly. We try to predict it, try we allocate our resources that way to actually stop crimes before they happen and deal with them when they do happen. Thank you. M Mr. Stern, did you, are your questions answered? Thank you. I think next in the queue, I have Mr. Rivera and then Ms. Salatel. No, you're good. Okay. Then Ms. Salatel. Thank you. Since these crime stats kind of look over um, the course of some time, I actually have some questions to kind of think about how or what we might see moving into this year. I have some concerns, um, particularly about vacancies. Um, in the November 22 expenditure report, um, the, um, I believe it was OMB reported there are 62 sworn vacancies. Do vacancies have an effect on, um, you know, these statistics, um, we're hearing about vacancies in a lot of departments. It, it is on our mind. Um, also, uh, you know, does the number of patrol officers have effects on these statistics? Because we're going to get, you know, additional updates, but I'm really trying to figure out what are the various factors at play um, and, you know, how many, are, are we down patrol officers? Are we good on um, patrol officers? Do we have a bunch of vacancies? Um, partly so we can plan and support the police department um, as we approach first quarter. Vacancies. All right. I am authorized 621 personnel in my department. 180 of those are non-sworn. 441 of them are sworn. Of my sworn officers right now, I have 25 vacancies. I have five already identified that are either going to retire or leave before the end of the uh, second quarter of this year. There will be more to come. I have two academies a year. Uh, neither, I haven't had a full academy in several years. The recent academy, which we discussed last time, I hired 16 people. We look for 28, that's our ideal number. Uh, we just closed yesterday. So if you guys didn't put in for to become a police officer, you, you lost it for, for June. So there's still, it'll open up again for December. Uh, as far as uh, non-sworn go, I have 22 vacancies there. Uh, so if you look at non-sworn, 22 vacancies out of 180, that's about 11%. We are constantly, we have open uh, and open sequestering for people to apply. I know I have five dispatchers, four records people, one fiscal clerk that are in the process now of going through, and we still have, we're still asking people to, to hire on. For patrol, if you look at 25 vacancies out of 441, that's roughly five and a half, six percent. If you take 30, that jumps me up to a little over six percent, maybe seven percent of my department. Does that play into it? I believe it does. Uh, because when you have more officers, all your units are full, uh, which also allows for flexibility, allows for more proactive 
uh, the ability to, for people to do officer initiated activity. And whenever you do officer initiated, initiated activity, uh, it reduces crime because a lot of times you catch people before they can actually commit crimes. And full units allow you to actually go out there. And when you look at the crime stats, you, you realize where the hotspots are, you know when the times are, so you actually come up with uh, directed assignments and you actually put officers in there to prevent crime in the future. So does that have a factor? It does. Is it an overwhelming factor? Uh, no, I don't think it's an overwhelming factor. Uh, we have dealt with shortages in the past and we'll dealt, deal with them in the future. We will do the best with what we have and we'll continue to drive forward and we continue to uh, look to hire more officers. May I ask a follow-up? So um, I appreciate that. Um, you said um, you had 25 vacancies for sworn staff and you gave me a percentage. I will never do math, but I think the premise of your percentage was that they were all patrol. Are all your sworn vacancies patrol officers or do you have vacancies throughout your sworn officers? Because not all sworn officers are patrol officers, right? That's true. So I do have vacancies. Like we won't, we know where we need to feel like robbery, assault, homicide, we're going to keep those filled, sexual assault. But some of our burglary units or uh, our property crimes units, we won't, we'll leave one or two detectives short. SROs, I can tell you we have, we're authorized 15. I only have 12 in SROs. A uh, patrol, our numbers are down in patrol. They're down in crime suppression as well. We we manage our vacancies by spreading across the board so that not any one unit is hampered and they can still fulfill their mission. Thank you. And one last follow up, if I may. I get this question all the time. Um, how many patrol officers are there typically on per shift? Because, I mean, with the vacancy, I don't know the answer to that right now. It it changes every day, but we'll average, we'll say between 28 and 32. Okay. Thanks. Um, just, I think as we continue to move forward in this committee, um, the vacancies, um, call times, those types of things. Um, I think we're, we're exploring this in nearly every department. So just a heads up, I think we're going to have continually kind of have these questions because I think it puts our statistics in, um, some context. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief. Doesn't look like any other questions, so you can move on to the next topic. All right, so uh, next I wanted to give you guys an update. Uh, you guys provided us funding for, uh, with the alcohol tax money, you provided us money for um, a dispatcher, a records clerk, and two, uh, we're gonna call them crime analysts. That's not what they're classified as, but they are crime analysts. Uh, and I thought you'd like some feedback. So I think you gave us some money in, uh, late to 2021 and we actually went through the we had to go to the classification and all that uh, we actually hired the two crime analysts uh, in march of 2022 and since then uh, i'm going to turn it over to brian brian's the uh, supervisor there he wants to show you what we where we are now where we're going what we actually do and uh, then we have a big ask for you at the end <laughs> All right, thank you, Chief. Uh, I can say that uh, we've made significant progress since we've been able to add personnel to our crime analysis and criminal intelligence unit. Uh, previously, we were uh, probably much more reactive and uh, focused more on statistics for the department. We've been able to add products and processes that have allowed us to try to respond to the department's needs to find uh, actionable information to help them prevent crime, solve crimes, find out where crimes are happening. So on the slide, we can kind of go over some of the things where we've added. Uh, we've started conducting weekly burglary series analysis, and I can go into more in depth in some of these here uh, in further slides. Uh, we've also added uh, weekly hotspot analysis, uh, looking at where crimes are happening, when they're happening, uh, and provide that information to patrol officers and detectives. Uh, we hold violent crime meetings. These meetings are held with our federal and state partners. Uh, the purpose of which is to determine who are our most violent offenders and what we can do to uh, lower violent crime overall. Uh, warrant packages, uh, we look, we get lists of warrants from the state uh, of who are people that currently are out on warrants and we put together a warrant package where we do research. And again, I'll, I'll go into this in more detail here in our future, future slide. Uh, a weekly CIT dashboard. This dashboard focuses on uh, people who are experiencing mental health issues 
Uh, and I can go into that in further detail because you have a slide for that in particular, as well as our CompStat Aurora slide. Uh, we also have added other products uh, with a recent overtime detail uh, that was authorized to place more officers in the area around the Sullivan. We provide information to them to help focus their efforts so that they can be more effective. Uh, we also assist detectives with research and analysis and their open investigations. Uh, we conduct open source research, uh, distribute the hot 30 warrant list so that everybody has access to it. Uh, we receive tips from outside agencies that we follow up. Uh, and then we work on the alcohol marijuana licenses called for service research. Uh, whenever licenses are up for review, that's something that our unit handles where we read through calls for service to determine if the business is at issue or if it's just something that's happening near the area. And then where we're going forward, uh, we would like to have, uh, and we are putting uh, an analyst stationed with an outside agency with a fusion center, the uh, state of Alaska. Uh, and that's going to increase our database capabilities. They have more capabilities than we have. Uh, a lot of different agencies work there. And we're going to be able to share information. Uh, we do, we want to move forward and do weekly series analysis on more than just burglaries. We want to expand our capability to be able to do that. Uh, it's a very labor intensive process and, and we need to, to be able to look at other crimes besides burglary. Uh, NIBIN report analysis. This is a national uh, ballistics database where it looks at shell casings and how they link to cases. Uh, we want to be able to develop and, and utilize that data to help solve and link violent crimes together. Uh, public net, network investigations analysis, uh, shots fired calls for, or calls. We look at where shots fired are, are occurring and we need to do further analysis on how we can help reduce shots fired in Anchorage. Uh, more warrant packages. Uh, that is something that is requested often from officers is is being able to help locate and find people that have active warrants and how to how to more effectively find them. Uh, and then as far as uh, communication analysis and link analysis, these are tools that I'll go over here in a few minutes that uh, we have acquired uh, and are still working on processing. Next slide, please. Okay, so I spoke of burglary series analysis. This is an example of one of the bulletins, uh, very redacted, um, but it what it basically covers is, is we uh, our analyst looks at burglary series burglary events that have happened over the last two weeks. Uh, we download that information. They scour through the the calls for service. They read reports. They review videos. They look at photos of uh, taking it on scene, and they compare this data and try to provide information to patrol and detectives to help them solve these crimes and link other crimes together. Uh, this bulletin is an example of where our analysts found multiple burglaries that were linked together uh, and provided this information to patrol officers so that they could be aware of it and keep an eye out for it and try to help us solve these crimes. Next slide, please. So this is a CompStat process, uh, computerized statistics. It's data that we provide to the department on a weekly basis uh, that gives them an overall trend and uh, analysis on what crimes are happening in Anchorage. And this is based on report data, not calls for service. So it's where reports were actually taken. Uh, it provides an analysis of whether we're seeing increases or decreases in these. Uh, and it's being used by command staff to allocate resources to where they need to be. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of our CIT dashboard. This is a product that was originally intended to address uh, mental people experiencing mental health issues. So what we did is we started digging through the data, reading through these call reports, identifying the individuals involved with those reports, and then creating a statistical analysis on them that basically says, these are the people who we experience calls with a lot. Uh, mental health calls, we have people that are frequent callers and we're trying to one address their needs but also then reduce the impact that they have on the department by getting them to the proper resources that they need so any any questions on that next slide please yeah i i actually just do um the just interested in we may dig into this more later but just the relationship between the cit dashboard and the mct is there is there a relationship there in terms of shared analysis and shared data 
Uh, this data does not get shared with the MCT. This is based on our calls for service and it contains, this is a scrubbed version that has no criminal justice information. The product that we're using has criminal justice information involved with it. And so we would have to be able to uh, clean it essentially to share it out with anybody. And then once this version is cleaned, it really wouldn't be usable by anybody because we take out names and addresses and, and things like that. However, this is a product that we utilize in conjunction with determining uh, is this a, it, it's, it's been used for our analysis to try to figure out, is this a call that should be handled by us? Is this something that should be handled by MCT? So if a call comes into us, uh, is this a person that based on the circumstances of the call, should they be handled by MCT or patrol officers? Ms. Salta. Thank you. So are you able to generate reports out of your scrub data um, as to like the type of call that comes in and maybe how it's resolved? Um, I'm trying to get a handle on like what's like what's being presented um, when the call comes in. Ultimately, where does it land? So was it the right place for the call? I think like you're trying to figure out um, because I think we're trying to figure out are we right sizing the resources for the call volume and wanting to leverage both the mobile crisis team and the mobile intervention team. And then of course, APD officers who just have to go out um, because a big impetus for creating the mobile crisis team was to um, deflect calls from APD um, and try to get them out of your call stack. So is, is that something we could look at like on a regular basis? Is there such a report? We're just trying to figure out how to get the data to make informed decisions. So I would have to defer to my command staff as to what they want to share. I mean, this is a product that we put together for our own use um, because we're trying to determine who our, our top customers are, who needs the most help, and then making sure that our people, are, they're directed towards the appropriate resources. Um, we, we collect, there are multiple data points. This is just a small snapshot of the data that we that we have in, in this product. Oh, sorry. Yes. Great. I look forward to that data. Um, and maybe we can add it as, I don't know. Um, I don't know if monthly data would be helpful, but maybe quarterly, at whatever you think paints the picture so we can take it through. Absolutely. All right. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Next slide, please. Yeah, actually, I have, I have oh, uh, right. Mr. Not Peterson next in the queue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I was looking at the top 10 list and are those numbers uh, annually or is that monthly or it's like one of these guys is 135 and I'm going, wow, I hope that's annual. <laughs> are you talking about the data that's right up here? Yeah. So the that is data that has been collected. We started collecting this in April of last year. This is this is not go back in time. The, to, the the effort to create this is essentially you have to go through and read each call for service. Uh, call data does not collect person data in the same way that a report does, so it requires more review to be able to parse out what the person's information is. So we haven't gone back in time. We basically started at a certain point and then started working forward from there. So so that's actually a little bit less than a year, like three quarters of a year. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Next slide, please. So again, unfortunately, heavily redacted, but uh, we can't share a lot of information out, but it just gives you an idea of, this is one of the uh, samples of the warrant packages that we'll uh, send to uh, either patrol officers or uh, whenever we do a warrant roundup or some sort of uh, task force directed activity where they're out looking for people with warrants or provide it to patrol officers so that they have it available to them. Uh, and we dig through all of our various resources. We look at addresses, vehicles, phone numbers, social media, uh, all with the intent of being able to identify where this person is and so that they can be arrested on their warrant. I actually have a question about that. The um, I'm just curious about the, the the utilization of resources and the um, the importance of that in terms of preventing crime or um, it, so can you speak to that a bit in terms of, of the use of resources to identify and pursue those with warrants versus other use of staff, the, the pro, sort of pro and con of that? So the, uh, 
we know who the most violent and prolific offenders are. And the majority of times they have warrants. So it's uh, a lot of people with warrants tend to commit more crimes. Uh, usually they don't have just one warrant. There's multiple warrants. Uh, we, we do balance that. We have, we do balance our time with the ability to allocate resources, but this is a, actually a very good utilization of resources, especially when we do, we do warrant roundups or we do, uh, uh, multi-jurisdictional we have the feds the state the local we you guys have seen it we bring 140 people together and we go out and we look for violent offenders and for them to put that, together these packages for one they verify that the warrants are in the system uh, so that we don't have mistakes and they get these packets out to people and there's more intel involved in there so that we can uh, efficiently effectively and safely arrest individuals based on the information they do so this is a, a a valuable resource that they provide to our department because not only is it the person, they have enough background in there, but we know, do we need our SWAT team to go there? Do we need extra precautions or is it just a, a shoplift, a shoplifting warrant or something like that? So uh, we, uh, we do manage our, the resources effectively so that we have the best utilization of the assets we have available to us. All right, and this is our calls for service dashboard. This is, again, calls for service like some of the other charts were. However, this is, we have filtered out a lot of the data. This is strictly just patrol officers. So we don't count uh, any other additional units in this. This is simply what, what's out on patrol. Uh, and it shows what the top 10 calls for service locations are uh, for the area, what day of the week, what time of day. Uh, and this is information that is used to help again, place officers in, in areas where they are needed. Ms. Alata has a question for you. Thank you. So does the calls for service break down um, by shift um, that you could be able to look at it on like a per shift basis? Um, I can see, like, I can't really tell much. This is one really tiny um, into a lot of information on one sheet. Um, and, and the reason I'm asking is we we have between 28 and 30 patrol officers and we see monthly calls. I don't know that July 22 stat says it's 12,582. I'm just doing some basic math and never trust my math, but I know that's a lot of calls. And so I'm just trying to get a better picture. So does it break down on a, on a per shift basis, on a per shift basis? per month basis, or is it only aggregate? This information is aggregate, but if you notice the bottom right chart where it's per hour of day, so that shows when those are, are occurring. What we could also do though is, is like we've got slicers in there that show uh, hour of day. So the officers can select the hours that they're working shift to determine what, and then the rest of the charts change with that. Okay, um, so I think for purposes of <clears throat> our role as in making investments into the police department, having some kind of um, report where we can look at, you know, what are the number of calls coming through for patrol, you know, for those 28 to 32 officers and kind of getting a sense of that then lets us talk with the public about why it's important because public gets mad about, you know, a couple of things in particular, wait times and the like, you know, and just not seeing police. And so if we can have some of that data, I think it will help us as we figure out where our investments need to be made. Thank you. And actually, if, if maybe you could expand on this a bit. Earlier, you spoke about the how you distribute your 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 officers um, in terms of shifts based on based on um, you know that um, to ensure that you uh, it's each shift is 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 filled to the degree that it can can be. Is that information? Is that information in terms of um, uh, available staff helpful? Do you believe in terms of our understanding of 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 where those resources need to to, to be? I'm not asking the question very, very clearly, but if we were to look at um, a breakdown of these calls per shift, would would we see it sort of evened out because you would have have moved all officers? in the most relevant places, or would we see shifts that are, that are, there are significantly fewer officers at certain, certain shifts because there was no, no officers available. We do allocate like day shift, swing shift, mid shift. We know that swing shift is the preponderance of calls. So we, 
put more officers on swing shift, few officers on day shift, and mid shift has the second highest number of officers. So we do allocate resources that way. Uh, the problem is like when swing shift, when they come on, there's they're going call to call to call to call. Once 10, 11 o'clock in the morning happens, day shift are going call to call to call to call. And then mid shift goes call to call to call until about three o'clock in the morning. And that's when they're actually, they can do some proactive work. And now in there, we do tend to look at the call stack and we'll pull two or three officers out and do directed assignments say, hey, we're having this problem here. We'll let some of the call stack up but we're going to send you guys to this area because this is where we've seen a proliferation of crime. So we do that, but we do allocate resources based on the number of calls that we can get. Uh, and I appreciate that. And I, and I, I think that there's, there's two, two, two pieces of the conversation we're having. One is, you know, are, are you managing and allocating your, your resources appropriately? And I, I have, don't have any doubt that you are, but the other pieces in terms of our role is, you know, where, where is there a need in terms of, you know, funding allocation? And, um, and so looking for data that would help us to determine that, looking for data that would help us to not only help us make good decisions in terms of where we're trying to allocate the funds, but also communicate to the, the public that there is a need. There, is a, there, are, there are fewer officers than, than we need because of the, the reasons we, we, we've discussed. Um, and that's, that, that's maybe part of the reason that we're not able to respond in, in as, as quick, quickly as, as we, we can. So two uses of the the, the data, um, and I and I think that that's what um, may be helpful in breaking some of this down is that is that it, it will allow us to to have a better view at um, what the what the vacancies how how they're having an impact on your ability to do your job. So that that's why I think it would be helpful to have some of this data bro broken in, into these shifts. I think we need to do a better job of educating the public on other options for filing a police report. Instead of waiting for a police officer, you can file reports online. Uh, so there are, there are other options there. Uh, so we'll actually work on that as well. All right, next slide, please. And this is just a sample of the liquor, marijuana license and safety hour uh, call for service review that we do. Uh, as licenses come up for re renewal or a new license or uh, say a change in location, that information comes to us and then we read through the calls for service for those particular locations to see if there's uh, any issues with the business, but in particular, just to at least, uh, when you pull calls for service for a particular address, we wanna make sure that that, uh, that call had something to do with that address and wasn't just called near there. <laughs> One of the things that we'll frequently do is we just filter out certain types of data, like a, a traffic stop. The traffic stop likely had nothing to do with that business or that location. Uh, and then we provide the information to the assembly uh, to help better make decisions on which licenses to re uh, keep or protest. I have a couple of questions for you, Ms. Zalatel and then Mr. Peterson. Thanks. So do you only look up the calls for service for the proposed location or if it's like a transfer, do you look up the calls for service at the like prior location? Because you can have an operator move from point A to point B and then if there were problems at point A, they could just follow up to point B. We, we look at the location of where the business is going to be located at. We don't necessarily investigate the operator. It's a matter of... Uh, I think I know what you're saying. I understand. Actually, when it when it is brought to our attention that someone is trying to pull that, that's when we put these guys on, and we'll do like a we'll do a crossover, and we'll make sure we get all the calls for service. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I just wanted to make you aware that we we sort of started discussions about going to a two year renewal cycle. Uh, for uh, alcohol licenses and marijuana licenses. And uh, one of the reasons we're doing that is because we, we have sort of a shortage of inspectors. And I'm, and uh, so we, I'm just wondering if you think that's a good idea because your officers would be spending a little less time doing inspections and maybe be out able to do other more proactive police work, so to, so to speak. I think it would be a great idea. I think we can identify, we know where the problem spots are and we could deal with them. We could probably concentrate on them more if we weren't dealing with every all the businesses at once. 
Mr. Chairman, I have one additional question, and I'm not sure exactly where to put this on, on the agenda, but I was looking uh, at a posting on next door yesterday and somebody had a picture of a gentleman coming up to his security camera and putting tape over over the lens so that it was wasn't going to be recording. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't know if this is something you've seen before, if this is a trend or, or something new, but I would, if I saw that, I would think that guy's getting ready, uh, you know, to break in at some point, you know, and, uh, but I, I was, I was a little surprised at that. That's, that's pretty aggressive, but. I can say I haven't seen any any instances of that yet, but that would most likely fall depending on, you know, if it happened at a person's residence or at a business, then it would be falling under our, most likely our, our burglary series analysis. Uh, and then our analysts would have, if they see something like that, that's a, that's a great example. <clears throat> excuse me. That's a great example of something that if our analyst sees that, they're going to then look through other cases to see if they can find repeats of that, see if this is a series where they're hitting multiple places uh, either geographically or just the same uh, way that they're operating. Uh, but I haven't heard anything on that yet. How long ago was this posting? I think yesterday I saw it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. I think you can go ahead. All right. Next slide then, please. So, like I said on the first uh, slide, uh, going forward, what we would like to be able to do is to increase our uh, NIBIN report analysis, our reports on uh, ballistic information from shell casings uh, found uh, from information submitted to ATF. Uh, analysis of this kind of data can really prove valuable and has proven valuable in other jurisdictions when looking at this to be able to help link and solve uh, violent crimes, uh, as well as putting out bulletins for patrols and detectives so that they can understand how these cases link together, how this information is valuable and to help us uh, keep collecting it and investigate these crimes. Uh, with our next uh, RMS, Records Management System, uh, Hexagon, uh, it comes with a lot of capabilities to provide dashboards for our officers so that it has information almost close to real time uh, so that they can pull that up at any given time. We're not there yet. So what we're looking at is what are some solutions now that we can use to create similar information for our officers uh, and part of that is, you know, maybe creating some of these in Excel like we've done with other products and then pr distributing those to uh, officers and putting in places where they can be able to view it. Uh, going forward, uh, we've already uh, received some software tools, but one of the things that we need is access to that NIBIN database. Uh, we're already in the process of setting that up. And so Anchorage PD will still be able to will be able to start getting some of that information uh, to the crime analysis unit. Uh, and then conducting weekly series analysis uh, on vehicle theft and, and shoplifting. Uh, as well as, like, like I said, we, re we I receive a copy of every report that's marked as shots fired. We enter that information into a database. We need to be able to do better analysis on that data uh, so we can identify, you know, better identify where shots are being fired on a consistent basis and then provide analysis to detectives uh, to do investigations into those crimes. Uh, communication analysis, link analysis, being able to do uh, analysis on, uh, say, phones that were recovered, uh, search warrants, uh, being able to see how criminals are communicating with each other, how criminals uh, link to each other, uh, to be able to resolve larger, more complex crimes. Uh, and then in the future, we're talking about providing on-scene case support, possibly having analysts when there is a homicide being able to send an analyst out there to provide information right now instead of having to wait later in, later in the day to have. So providing them an additional resource, not only to provide them the resources that we have, but also to free them up to conduct better investigations. Uh, and then again, I would love to be able to increase our analytical support. Uh, ideally, I would love to have a crime analyst with assigned to specific units, say to patrol, have an analyst that's dedicated to just property crimes, having an analyst that's dedicated to violent crimes uh, and be able to have them spend more time with their, those units directly to provide better analysis for their customers. All right, thank you, Brian. So that, that's the big ask. Uh, I wanted to show you guys how well this money is being spent and utilized with the Anchorage Police Department. 
And it, if there's a possibility that we could, what Brian asked me to do was take some of my patrol officer PCNs and do away with them and provide additional crime analysts, which I don't want to do. So I wanted to come back to the funding source and you guys pay for two of them. If I could get two or three more in future years, I would appreciate it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I get some questions here. That's great. Uh, Mr. The alcohol Rivera. tax pays for two of them, I should say. Yeah. Mr. Rivera and then Ms. Salto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you sort of went in the direction I was asking. So I assume that this means that APD will be putting in a first quarter uh, budget request, or is it going to be sooner than that? I, I actually, I won't put in a budget request this year. We, this is just a, something to ask for. I, I really can't with my vacancies. I really can't ask for a, a digital budget thing. So it's a, I don't want to seem greedy. We are the, I mean, I'm already like what 60 something percent of the budget already. So it's kind of, I need to make sure there's enough money out there for other departments. So this is just something for the future. I know something to think about it and it's alcohol tax money. I don't want to actually go in there. But this, this is for the future. This is what we want to do. Uh, we're taking, we've taken great strides since March of last year, getting these people educated, our analysts educated, and actually having tools that we use. And we would love uh, in future years to actually to be able to expand on this. Thanks. No, that's that's really helpful. And since this is going to be much more future focused and not something in the short term. You know, I think for me and perhaps some of my colleagues, it would be helpful to get a better sense of some of these going forward requests, how they would have impacts uh, on the streets, because I think that's what most of our constituents want. Um, and, and in that, you know, that's why most of our constituents focus on patrol officers. Um, and so if we're going to be making investments that aren't in patrol officers, I think really understanding how that investment's going towards benefiting public safety for our community would be helpful. Ms. Alto? Thanks, I have two questions. Do they, are these, would these be sworn or non-sworn positions? These are non-sworn positions. Okay, so is there a possibility you could repurpose some of your non-sworn vacancies to mm, this? No, I'm I, getting a firm no. No. Okay. <laughs> that we're, they are overworked and understaffed. Okay. Um, well, but you have 22 not, so you need all 22 to kind of get yourself going. Okay. I so I have a slightly different view than Mr. Rivera. I think this is needed sooner rather than later, um, partly because I'm interested in seeing, um, since I believe, you know, we do have some vacancies, getting a deeper look at the data, like the things we've learned today that you're tracking, where you are tracking it, I think is really important. I don't know if I would 100% agree with where you're hoping to get your additional crime analysts, you know, where to deploy them. Just, I'm sure it's from your point of view that it's absolutely where you need it. But from our point of view, we would probably have some feedback about that. Um, but I think the more data driven we can be to target resources, I I'm all for it. And I would um, ask you to think about whether maybe what the top one is, especially as you look at the data on the end of last year, I think we started to see, you know, stats went way down for a while. And now on um, some of those stats are starting to creep up a little bit. If something like this could be a proactive step to hopefully get those stats back down. So I give you kind of the invitation if you want to look for a budget request. I understand there's a lot um, of opportunities, but even if we could start with one time and then we could try to operationalize it. Thanks. Do you know what charts I could give you for your CIT dashboard if I had two additional people? I, that might be what I was <laughs> alluding to. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Altel. Um, just to, um, um, I, I want to build on that just a little bit that, um, the one of the challenges that I'm seeing is is that we we are we are essentially using homicides and calls for service as a metric for safety in our city. And and I don't think it's an accurate way to determine whether our city is safer or not. And 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 yet your your analysis is rather sophisticated in terms of 
of what's going on and and how you're analyzing where crime is happening and what kinds of crime is happening that sort of thing but the but the result data right is really limited in terms of the telling the whole story um and so this is partly what i'm challenged with is is that is that there are i i think that there are other indicators towards safety uh that are out there that i i'm not gonna i can't guess right now but i would imagine that there are other ways to measure um whether the city is is becoming safer or not in a variety of ways and and i find it really interesting that how how wonderfully sophisticated and thoughtful this work is and the 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 outcome um numbers seem a little old-fashioned to me right um you know whether someone called or not um and so that's something that i really like to dig into more and learn more about is it is is how are other cities um using data to determine whether the work that you're doing is actually um making the city safer or not um and um and so that's that's i guess just an overall st statement and it links into the comment that i've made the last few meetings that, that i do think that there is a, an effort that we need to go through in order to think about a larger public safety strategic plan for this city that involves the police department the fire department the department of law maybe the health de 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 department and thinking about what is a safer city look like and what is the in what is the information that we need to 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 show progress towards that um so I, i'm just saying that because i, I think that th this this highlights it for me this highlights the the incredible work yet this doesn't tell me much at all and this this was cut down from about 28 slides sure. and what this doesn't show is the training that the analysts have gone through mm -hmm. we're a public safety partnership city here in anchorage uh, they've gone on brian go ahead and tell where you guys have gone how you how do we come up with these charts and how we compare it to other cities so the training that we've received through our public safety partnership is is extensive we've been able to go and visit with other departments to see how their crime analysis units uh what their best practices are we've been to milwaukee uh, uh down to phoenix uh, uh down in colorado to vegas and and seeing how their departments work and we're trying to basically plagiarize from whoever's doing things and and seeing if there's a way that we can adopt it here and if it's a process that'll work here uh, in addition to that, we've been uh, provided training through the International Association of Crime Analysts. They have, uh, and this was especially helpful during the pandemic, uh, they offer 12-week online courses uh, where you are in a class. You, are, you get assignments, you do homework, uh, and at the end of it, uh, you get a certificate of completion indicating that you've completed this course of study. And these are all crime analysis-related courses, be it, you know, everything from crime analysis 101 essentially to um, how do you do how do you best utilize the resources that you do have uh, taking a course uh, one of the courses that we took had to do with how to best utilize Microsoft Office for law enforcement being able to extract data using Microsoft access and other products uh, so sorry I probably started to ramble a bit <laughs> so anyway we started at ground level back in March of last year, this is how far we come. The reason we have charts like this, because this is how we always used to do it. So we are evolving. Like I said, this is three quarters of a year. Uh, so we will take your advice and we will go forward and we will try to get slides that are more. No, I, and I appreciate that. And I, I guess what I'm saying is, is and I, and I, I want to make sure I'm being really clear is, is that, is that, that, um, that, that my sense is that that this work is actually likely work, working, and I want to be able to, to 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 demonstrate how it's working in a broad, broader way. And and the other piece that I just I said already, but I'll just repeat is is that the outcomes don't just come through your department, right? They're happening across across the the, the city in a variety of ways. And my one of my concerns is that I, I still believe, even though I know you communicate with AFD and the health department quite a bit in terms of how our the departments work. I believe there's a lot of opportunity to to align them e even more, and so I think through the reporting and data um, that, that 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 can happen as well. Um, and I have a question from Ms. Stern. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know if there's anywhere in these reports where you could add either 
how you internally count for underreporting or maybe how they do that at a, at a regional or national level? Because I know that that can sometimes be a problem. And I'm just, I'm just wondering if that's something that you factor in. We don't factor in that. Uh, we don't know if it, there's underreporting or not because what we, you'll find that people will call you and say, they'll call you to report something. And the first thing you need to tell them is you need to call the police to report that. Because if you don't report it, it doesn't, it never happened. And that's the bottom line. And I, members of, that have been on the assembly for a while know that constituents will call them. And the first thing they'll tell them is you need to call the police because if, it, if you don't report the crime, it never happened. So we have no idea if there is underreporting. We trust that people are called, call the police when they should call the police. Thank you. And, and just one last thing before I go on, I, I made a note here that that um, you had mentioned earlier that um, uh, part of the responsibility of, of, of preventing and identifying crime is the role of citizens in that and, um, and calling and, and participating. And I'm curious about the, the information that you're gathering about you know, hot spots, about trends, about this sort of information. Some of it is, wouldn't be public, and I can understand why, um, but I wonder if some of it can be as a way to better inform people and, and, and put tools in their hands to be able to actually participate more in helping to prevent crime and how that information could be shared out um, as a way to empower citizens to, um, to engage in really productive work to help. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. So when we first um, changed our uh, beat boundaries, which is kind of the basis for our calls for service data, we did it along community council lines specifically for all of you, um, because we know that you communicate with the community council districts. Prior to 2020 in the shutdown, we had patrol officers on a regular basis, particularly going to the community council meetings that are high volume, high, high volume call areas. Uh, we picked that up a little bit. We're not at the level we were before 2020. Some of it's because of staffing. And one of the things we we did was the the chart that, talked, that looked at patrol calls for service. As our officers would go in, with that community council district data and say, this is what's been happening in the last seven days in your area. And then let's say it's burglaries. Then they would provide information to those community council meetings. Here's some of the things, it was doors unlocked. They were coming through windows. This is what they were taking. This is, so they would provide that information. It's extremely valuable. It breaking it up into community council district is then we're all talking the same language, the same area. So um, reporting in the future, kind of going back to your question on that very busy slide, we can break it down a little better for, for you all in community council district, time of day, officer staffing. It's it's all doable. That's that's fantastic. And 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 would uh, knowing staffing is a challenge, but um, but would love that information and, and for that that to to pick up again. Thank you. Chief. Thank you, Brian. You can go back to your training if you need to. He, he's in training today, so thank you, Chief. Uh, so the next thing, a uh, body cam update. Uh, this is a uh, monthly thing until we get body cameras on the street. Uh, arbitration is still scheduled for sometime in April. Uh, as far as the uh, acquisition of body cameras, uh, we have uh, one vend one of the three vendors scheduled for the first week in March to come up to do a demo. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back from the other two vendors, uh, whether they can come in February or early March. Uh, we expect to choose a vendor by the end of March, and then we just have to go through the uh, the contracting part of it, which who knows how long that will take. So uh, we are going forward. Like I said, we're scheduling. We have three vendors. We're waiting to hear back from two of them. Uh, the first one, the one the one that has committed is committed to the uh, the first week in March. So like I said, we do ex we expect to choose a vendor by the end of March. Mr. Rivera, are you in the queue? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so can you speak to me a little bit about the criteria that you will be using to choose a vendor? Well, we're gonna have three demonstrations and we have a list of uh, different agencies and people that are together. Uh, they're gonna provide the demonstration and we're going to make sure that it uh, conforms with our policy and then meets all our needs and meets the national best practice. Uh, I'll have to, I will look at the criteria that we are going to evaluate it on. If it's uh, releasable, I will provide the assembly with what our criteria will be. 
Thanks. That, that would be helpful. And I think in, in part, you know, I think we had learned through this process that depending on the vendor that you use, it can be easier or not to redact certain information and, you know, going to the policy, you know, I think that's an, an important issue for myself, as I've stated many times and many members of the community. So uh, I think it would be helpful to get us into the criteria that the department is using. All right. Any other questions on body cameras? Yeah. So just there's just a couple from from me. Um, the 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 process of evaluation of it, it's not a public pro process. That this is an internal process, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and um, and the um, in terms of the the ar arbitration, is there is there any any estimate at this point of the time frame for that to be completed? Some of that depends on how long it takes the arbitrator to get the decision back. Um, but we're expecting like late fall to hopefully get a decision back. That's an estimate. Um, but we are continuing to have conversations to try to resolve this prior to arbitration so that it can get resolved sooner. Okay. And, and, and without, without revealing anything that you're not allowed to ha have the, have the issues surrounding the arbitration changed or are they, they're the same. They're the same. Um, and then, and then um, uh, the, the the next piece I wanted to make sure that I I had a conversation with with the municipal manager specifically about first quarter budget revisions, um, and and he committed to me that he would work with with you, chief, and the municipal attorney to uh, to work on developing a, a very specific um, request for first first quarter but budget revisions to ensure that we have the funding necessary for the Department of Law and any other area that we need to make sure we have the infrastructure, staffing, et cetera, um, so that when this policy is, is passed and, and then the vendor is, is chosen, that there's no, um, no additional roadblocks for us to move forward. I just wanted to get you on the record. Will, will you commit to make sure you work with the, with the municipal manager and the Department of Law to get that first quarter um, re request to us? Oh, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm gonna just make sure I'm checking to see if there's any other questions in the queue. Uh, it does not appear so. Thank you. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is Sullivan Arena. Uh, so I just uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, just this is just a recap for January. The calls for service at the uh, top ten call service at the Sullivan Arena itself, as you can see. Uh, we had a pretty major uptick. Uh, we're up to 142 for the top 10. Uh, next slide, this is for the surrounding area. And you can see uh, we're, since uh, November, we've been well above 200 for November, December, and January. So as a result of that, uh, I know that you guys got together with the municipal manager and uh, we've been trying to see how we can deal with the uh, areas surrounding the Sullivan Arena to make sure that the citizens of Anchorage that live in that area feel served and protected. Uh, so we uh, came up with a strategy and we've implemented that. It's been going on for just about a week now. And to cover that, I'm handing it over to Lieutenant Evans, who is in charge of that program. Thank you, Chief. Um, yeah, so the uh, community policing in around that area, um, the goal is for us to have a zero tolerance for the area. And the area that we are focusing on is um, south of 15th Avenue, um, west of A Street, east of um, Gamble, and north of 24th. So that core area and the Chester Creek um, Sport Complex area, officers um, are instructed not to um, be in on the property of uh, the solar arena unless there's an emergency, of course, but just to patrol around those uh, the different areas in there. Um, <clears throat> the officers are tasked with um, foot patrol, um, traffic enforcement and vehicle enforcement in and around that area. Um, I like the chief indicated um, the program, uh, the, the community policing has begun. Uh, we started on January 23rd and how we set it up um, for the month of January, um, we had about six shifts that we were due various times, various days, um, so that we don't create a pattern for those um, individuals around that area to get used to. 
um, and for the month of January, just um, a couple of um, stats. We had about 32 officers um, run through the month of January, and it, it, this, these stats are from January 23rd, um, January 25th, January 26th, uh, the 27th, 28th, and the 31st. So uh, we had uh, just the officers on foot patrol themselves made 55 contacts. Um, they were able to um, make two arrests and issued um, a citation um, for jaywalking in that area, which, if you know jaywalking, um, is a problem. Then uh, moving down, we also have the, in the area, like I said, we do traffic enforcement, vehicle enforcement. Um, our officers were able to contact 82 um, traffic violators and issue out 62 citations um, for that, for that zero tolerance. Our goal is to make a great impact. And I talked to the officers that, um, for the month of January, and they said that as they were doing foot patrol and, and out, the citizens in that area contacted them and thanked them for being in that area, um, which um, I'm kind of envious of the officers. I spent a lot of time in the in the office, but I would like to be able to go out and walk to the beat and walk in the Chess Creek area and make those contacts with them. And all the contacts that we've made thus far have been um, positive in nature. <clears throat> Moving forward um, through the month of February, um, March, April, in May is what the, pro the project's gonna go. And we're going to increase the number of officers that we have. We're gonna do three shifts um, to try and get different times so people can see us out there and then contact those individuals who um, like to be out late. Um, so we have a morning shift that's gonna run from nine o'clock in the morning to one in the afternoon. And then you'll have a evening, late afternoon shift that's gonna run from five o'clock to, what time is it? <laughs> um, and then we'll have a, a late evening shift. Um, and that the goal is just to, to diversify and to contact and to get as many um, officers as we can on that goal. So on those shifts, we'll, we're looking at maybe increase in 12 officers um, each on each of those morning, afternoon, and evening shifts. Um, and thus far, um, positive feedback from the officers, um, positive feedback from the citizens, and uh, we're just gonna continue to move forward and support that area. I've got some questions for you. Um, Mr. Salt is first. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, so the question, we've all received some emails. Are you seeing much activity between south of Chester Creek and 24th. I've had a few complaints from that neighborhood. And, and when the officers go on patrol, do they stop and s spend some time there, maybe do paperwork or just park to observe versus just you know driving through the neighborhood? It's a combination of both. They are driving through that neighborhood and they are um, foot patrol through that neighborhood for this detail. And will they go into the woods as well? Yes, they walk the, the Chester Creek bike path um, and in that neighborhood just north of 24th. And then south okay. of- Thanks, I know, I know you're different. I, I know it's making a difference. He, he just said thanks. I know it's oh. making a difference. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Rivera, are you in the queue? Yes. yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, I really thank you for all of your efforts. Um, I have though a, a comment that's not necessarily about APD, but more about the system, both inside and, and outside the Sullivan, and then a question. So uh, my concern about what's happening at the Sullivan right now is that it's a, a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And by that, I mean, the system inside and outside the Sullivan is traumatizing and re-traumatizing individuals, which is leading to increased negative activities in the neighborhood, which is leading to more calls for service around the Sullivan, uh, which is then leading to more traumatizing and re-traumatizing. And, and here we go, the self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, 
I am wondering if there is a more um, understanding that a lot of these issues are dealing with mental health issues, not necessarily issues um, that are, you know, directly related or to APD in terms of the expertise that you all have. So I'm wondering if there's more of a public safety and public health response that we can really use at the Sullivan. I'm thinking very similar to what was utilized at Brother Francis Shelter. There was an all hands on deck and actually maybe Captain Case, you were actually very involved with that if I remember an all hands on deck um, where there was EMTs, there was AFD, uh, I think when the, I think it was the MIT, the mobile intervention team, that was their first big project that they took on when they were first created years ago. I'm wondering if there is, you know, so, so we don't continue to spiral, which is what I'm really concerned that will happen at the Sullivan. I'm wondering if there is that way to break the cycle and have a public safety and a public health response um, that is really coordinated among the various uh, partners in the municipality and outside agencies? Is that something that's been considered? How about I give you an invitation? Um, one of the individuals that's a, that's a clinician that worked at the Sullivan the previous time happens to be a employee of ours right now. She has a very holistic view of the Sullivan and services that can or cannot be provided and how the police department and mental health and, you know, the health department. And I, I think you would benefit from that type of a conversation from somebody who now has a perspective of, first of all, it's a clinician perspective, right? So that's her base. Um, and now she works for the police department. And I think, um, well, I'll just say, I think she's a very, very good person to kind of get that, that view from many, many perspectives that put it together. And at the end of the day, she wants to help people. So, you know, I think her heart's, we're not going to question where her heart's at. That's for sure. Great. Yeah, I will follow up with you on that invitation. Thanks. Uh, I have Mr. Volan next and then Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Um, I would also be interested in, in learning more about that. I, I appreciate that question from Mr. Rivera. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things and I have a couple questions. Um, so is the, the 1600 Gamble Street block your top location of calls for service currently in the municipality? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and then I believe members of the public can, can find this presentation on our the committee website. Some of these numbers, I think, if people are watching on video, the very small print. And I don't know who printed these copies for us. I appreciate whoever that was. Um, you're keeping me in business. I would maybe maybe <laughs> encourage you, whether it was, I think it's probably our the clerk's office, but um, flip it hamburger style, maybe instead of hot dog style, because even me, I'm kind of having trouble with a little bit of this. But on, on that, if we could go back to the second slide, that's the Sullivan. So this is the Sullivan Arena itself. And just that upper quadrant, upper the top right quadrant, I think is is pretty staggering. Um, you know, obviously this is the Sullivan Arena as a facility is what I'm understanding. These are those calls for service, but also the third slide. You know, if we look at the bottom grand total, August 134 calls for service, and then January 286. Um, you know, I, I think that that is, is notable. And so I appreciate that this work has started um, and that you have uh, been able to, to work with the administration on getting this ball rolling because I think it is much needed along with other supports, mental health, et cetera. Um, a question that I have, and I think this kind of gets back to what the chair was commenting on earlier. So these are the calls for service. I would anticipate you're getting a lot of repeat calls from individuals. And I, I guess I'm just kind of wondering about that full story. What is the response? How many of these are um, 
have had a response or, or valid um, things that needed to be addressed. Does that make sense? So I'd just like to learn, I don't know if you can answer that now, but I'd like to learn more about that. What is, what is the follow-up, what's being done to address some of these calls? Um, or how many of them is maybe the same angry person calling and calling and calling? Well, I think you have to look at the type of call. Like Medic Assist, we had 29. I mean, those are just, those are calls that we would accompany medics with. Disturbances, 26. So those are actually, you know, calls, mental persons, uh, 25. And these are only the top. So the number of calls actually are greater than this. These are only the top 10. Uh, but you can see most of these are, you can, suspicious people, there's only six of them, welfare checks, one. Suicide threats for, I mean, most of these calls, if you look at it, there it requires an officer response. Now, if it comes in as an assault, it might just end up being classified as something different. But these calls are, the way they happen here, this is the final disposition of them. So if we get sent to a assault call and it gets classified as a disturbance, it would show up here in the disturbance, not the assault call. So I think these are all pretty reflective of the work that APD is doing there. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I think that is all I have other than um, the jaywalking thing is interesting because that Campbell Ingrid corridor is very pro problematic for pedestrians to begin with, especially with all the snow that we've had. And I know um, with that zero tolerance policy that y'all are trying to enforce, I think um, that's gonna be probably a trickier component um, gives me a little concern just because those sidewalks are real narrow in a lot of Fairview. We got utility poles in the middle of them, something that needs to be addressed on on the, on the traffic side. Um, and then I would just encourage, and I, I think you probably already are um, having a dialogue with the Fairview Community Council. I think it would be very helpful for them to hear um, a more maybe briefer update on the work that you guys are doing. Thanks. I have a few more questions. Mr. Peterson is next and then Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I'm interested in getting uh, a report at our public safety meeting next month from the clinician uh, that you were just talking about. It sounded like she might have some information uh, that we, we would like to hear. And so I'm wondering if she might be available for that. Right, Hannah's going to be coming. <laughs> I open it up for a special invitation. And how about we assess that special invitation first before <laughs> I commit to that? Okay. It just sounded to me like, you know, if you, if you have someone that has that kind of experience, they might have information that, uh, you know, we would like to know. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Ms. Stern? Thank you. I just have a follow-up to um, Mr. Vaughn's question. How many of these are maybe uh, multiple calls for the same event? Would that have been scrubbed out of here? Yes, okay. that's scrubbed. Okay, I just want to make sure. Thank you. It looks like those are the questions. I, I have um, uh, just a... Um, um, I guess uh, starting with a comment, I wanted to just in this uh, again. I don't think this is this is within your purview. Um, we've been receiving a number of, of reports about what's happening within the Sullivan, and um, and I think it's really important to just recognize that that um, um, these reports are, are are saying that it's a it's a it's it's really a mess, and that and that um, that this is part of the problem in terms of what's spilling out in into the streets. That that that, that it's not not being managed well, and that. And that there's some really serious things going on inside of there. So, I, I think that the, those two things are, are related. I wanted to also th thank you for for this work of, of 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 increasing the patrol, particularly the foot patrol, because I think that that this is work that 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 really doesn't work by driving by. I think being being on the ground and, and interacting with, with with people is really important. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the the positive results of this um, over the next few few weeks. Um, so th thank you for being here and th th thank you for doing that work. So, Chief, anything else from you? 
just want to give you a quick update. Um, Narcan has been a so the majority of our officers are carrying Narcan now. Just wanted to update the uh, public safety committee on that, the assembly. So the majority of officers, we have a few stragglers that haven't that have been on leave or uh, haven't gone through the training, but uh, Narcan is part of APD's uh, toolkit now. Thank you. Um, and I don't see any other questions. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for all the information. We really, uh, really appreciate it. Fire department, next month. Fire department we're gonna, they're on fire next month. Uh, Monica, you wanna come up for a, for a brief report? I don't have much of a report. Um, I'm the acting municipal prosecutor, Monica Elkington. Um, we are in the process of hiring uh, new attorneys um, and filling some of our vacancies. So we're experiencing the same vacancy issue that uh, seems like every department is. And I, I did have a question. We, we earlier in the meeting, um, there was a reference to one of the, the one of the, the reasons for the uptick in, in crime stats. I wonder if you would be willing to respond to that. Did you hear those comments and uh, if yeah. you'd be able to share your, your perspective on that? Yes. Um, I was just thinking as we were talking earlier that it might um, help if maybe at our next meeting, I have a um, maybe a presentation about what our um, department does in municipal prosecution. Cause I think not, um, you know, there's some new members and not everybody knows, but, uh, we have two um, main sections. We have our domestic violence section, which focuses on misdemeanors that are uh, domestic violence crimes. And then we have a, um, the general trial section, which um, focuses a lot on DUIs, first and second DUIs in the municipality. And then also um, we prosecute a lot of shopliftings and a lot of um, uh, business, other business related crimes or where victims the victims of the crimes are businesses. So things like um, if there's trespasses or if there's um, both commercial trespass, like if there's um, uh, people in a business uh, that won't leave or causing a disturbance, that sort of thing. We also prosecute um, residential trespass, things like um, if uh, often it's like uh, squatters in an empty apartment. Um, or vacant apartment, that sort of thing. Um, but we do prosecute a lot of those crimes. Um, in shopliftings in specifically, uh, we have to prioritize every single one of these cases that we do, especially with vacancies. And um, for shoplifting specifically, we look at um, whether there is video and whether the witnesses are available. And we do sometimes get reports of shopliftings where the witnesses might be a loss prevention officer or store employees um, and their contact information is not provided. Or by the time we get the case several months after the shoplifting has occurred, that loss prevention officer has moved on or um, sometimes the store believes that there is video um, and the report we have from the officer is that the, the store manager or the loss prevention officer will later upload the video um, and we don't always have it. Um, so there are a number of reasons, mostly evidentiary reasons why, um, and this doesn't just apply to shopliftings. We have to look at, for every single one of our cases, we're screening them based on whether we have the evidence to prosecute. But um, uh, in particular, those are some, some that apply um, to shoplifting cases specifically. We do prosecute many shopliftings and we can get um, a number by the, by the next meeting, but that is one of the main bread and butter that our office does. Over a certain amount, it's a felony and then that goes to the state, but um, we do handle the misdemeanors in Anchorage. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to sort of uh, center in on what I think the, the main point of uh, Chief Curl was, and that is that um, that because of COVID, because of vacancies, because of backlog, that we as a city have been less able 
to to prosecute and to hold people accountable for the crimes that they're committing and that that has become in some ways a um a known and and is resulting in people feeling more free to commit crimes and so i, I guess i'm i'm curious from your perspective about your office's capacity to to prosecute yes. and whether that has been hampered over the last few years and there is a backlog and that there's some truth to, to that and i the second part of the question really is um what's moving forward what's the what's the, the change going to be over the next year are we going to be able to get, get caught up and and be responding uh, in a more appropriate way sure uh i think i can say yes there is somewhat of a backlog Absolutely. Um, uh, while jury trials were paused for a period of time during COVID, jury trials have opened back up. Most of our cases do not go to jury trials. In most of our cases, we are making an offer to resolve to the defense attorney, and then that defense attorney is conveying that to their client, and then the case is settling. And that's the vast majority of our cases, and that continued all through COVID. Um, ha I will say that um, for specifically property crimes, one thing that hampered us a lot was um, SB 91 uh, in that um, the uh, level of prosecutable crime and the sentence under SB 91 was very, very minimal. So that really empowered a lot of um, uh, thieves to walk into stores and steal stuff. Um, I mean, we were seeing during that time, um, a uh, people would just pull, especially liquor off the shelf in a liquor store, say to the clerk, you can't do anything, and they would walk away. Um, and for some stores, um, the store staff has found that it's more dangerous to confront these individuals um, than it is to kind of let them go and, and shoulder the loss. Um, I think that's very unfortunate. And since there's been a change in the law and that has been repealed, there are still attitudes from the, you know, the defendants that, that um, you know, they don't follow the legislature closely, right? I mean, like there's still attitudes that, that they're entitled to some of this. So um, <clears throat> I, I think that's, that's a bigger effect on it than um, than what's happening in our office. Um, however, there is some backlog and we do have to um, prioritize. For instance, um, the prosecutor's office has a municipal prosecutor and then we've got two sections, um, each with a deputy um, a municipal prosecutor. The deputy of the general trial um, division he left in September, along with the head municipal prosecutor. She left in September as well. Both of them went to work for uh, the state in various capacities. And so I'm the deputy of domestic violence, and I have been filling in as acting municipal prosecutor. Um, before he left, the deputy for general trial was attending a meeting every month with all of the loss prevention officers from around the city to talk about prevention and to talk about um, addressing certain crime rings, people who would steal stuff and then sell them. Um, and he had targeted uh, some people for prosecution. Um, and then he left and that work has not been able to continue. So that is a position that we have not been able to fill. Um, and so some of the, the like, it wasn't as much as the analytics that APD was showing you today, but um, some of the kind of special projects and special targeting that we were doing has all stopped because of our vacancies. Um, so we have, uh, we have been working hard to fill positions. Um, my understanding, and I just checked yesterday, is that we have some people that are set to be hired that are waiting on approvals. Um, and so uh, we're working on getting back up to speed. We hired a, um, one attorney started in the last month. Um, and so uh, we are working on getting back up to speed. I'm not sure when um, those kinds of projects like meeting with the loss prevention and that kind of thing will happen again um, uh, whenever we get a, a new general trial deputy, I would guess. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your report. Thank you for your presentation. Doesn't look like there's any questions. Okay. Yep. yep. Thank you. 
Uh, we have a, a couple of minutes. Uh, I want to make sure um, before we adjourn the meeting. I, actually, before you leave, I didn't want to just get on the record. The same thing I said to, um, to, to Chief Case that um, I spoke to the municipal manager. He has agreed to work with your office mm -hmm. and with uh, the APD on developing a first quarter budget request. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to see that, at least a draft of that, by our next meeting. Can you commit to working with them on doing that? So I report um, to the municipal attorney. Yes. So um, that would come through their office. Um, I'll do whatever I can, but I, that's not something that I can do independently. So, um, right. Well, I, I think it'll get there anyway, but if you could please forward the message to your, your boss. I will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for being here. Is, yep. is there anyone in the, in the audience or on the phone who would like to, um, to speak? There's a short time available for audience participation. Yes, sir. Come, come on up. Um, you can actually grab that microphone right there on the end of the table. If you would uh, share your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Oh, got to push the little button. It's a button. Yeah, there you go. Hi, Jim Short. Uh, I've actually spoken in front of the assembly uh, regarding the homeless shelter at the Sullivan Arena. And uh, one of the things that I've been pursuing since that reopened was the reinstallation of the physical barrier between the Sullivan Arena and Bimboki and Mulcahy rinks. Um, as a hockey parent, uh, I've experienced this both with and without the barrier in previous seasons. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, it is a night and day difference. Mm -hmm. The lack of that barrier has resulted in me calling the APD multiple times this season. The very first time was the very first time this season that that facility was reopened that I was at Bimboki. I've been there 10 minutes, had to leave my kid in the car and got out to intervene on behalf of a couple of high school hockey players that were waiting for their ride home. It's continued the last three times that I've been to Mulcahy. Uh, the first time a woman was apprehended that was amongst our kids before we arrived and unbeknownst to us, she was waving a knife around. Um, the next time, uh, all of this within the last week, uh, one of the parents reported there was possibly a body between where we park and the rink. The person was actually just passed out drunk. CSP showed up and took them to go sleep it off. Last night, the only adult male skater outdoors at Mulcahy elected to leave when he could safely do so as a result of an ongoing dispute between two clients at the Sullivan. Um, our kids aren't safe there right now. Um, I've been trying to get this done since October. Uh, just by pure luck, I got here. Uh, I would like to thank Assemblyman Rivera. Um, my wife was actually uh, received an email from you about this meeting. That's why I'm here. So um, anyway, I've talked to uh, almost anybody I could get a hold of at APD. I just got off the phone with Alexis Johnson. Um, I understand this is a budget issue. Money is not just laying around. We really need this back, though. So thank you for consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks. And I think uh, with no questions in the queue, and uh, I think our time is up, uh, I'm, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you. I have time. a question. Sure. Actually, can I get a, a motion to, to extend for, for, for five, five minutes? Move so to extend second. five minutes. Second. OK. Uh, seeing no objection, uh, we're, we'll extend the meeting for five minutes. Ma'am, if you could sh st state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to, to, to speak. Thank you. My name is Ashlyn Mucker. Um, I'm calling because I am concerned about the fact that APD is not wearing their body cam still. But um, on another note, I am concerned about the violence that is happening um, outside of the Gaslight Bar. And um, wondering if APD is doing anything or if they can maybe have officers posted around bar closing. There has been two murders there in the last um, month and a half or two months. Um, so that is just one concern. And I um, I'm also concerned about their alcohol license. I mean, if you go into that bar, you're likely to find a handful of underage people or more. Um, and it's quite obvious they're over-serving. Their um, security staff does not seem to be doing their job. Um, and it really is just a danger to all the bridge. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your, for your testimony. Um, Mr. Volan, did you want to um, make a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we normally don't answer questions 
during this time, but I, I would flag for the caller who just spoke that that will be a topic of conversation at the next downtown community council. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else on the phone uh, from the public who'd like to speak? If so, if you could make yourself known at this time. Okay, hearing none, um, I, I adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.